Well, let's discuss lunar and solar eclipses. Look at that ominous lunar eclipse series here. Isn't that awesome? Well, let me begin by pointing out the reason why there's not an eclipse during every orbit of the moon, where the moon gets in the way of the sun to produce a solar eclipse, or the earth gets in the way of the sun to produce a lunar eclipse. And the basic reason is seen here in somewhat crude form, namely that the orbital in inclination of moon's orbit is not lined up with the ecliptic plane. So the plane of moon's orbit and the ecliptic plane, the plane of Earth's orbit around the sun, are tilted by about five degrees. This shows more than that, but because of that tilt, things don't line up correctly. So let's look at a little more detail. Here it is, and it's very clearly seen here. It's the, what I'm calling the orbital plane problem. So here we have the ecliptic plane, and there's the sun, and the orbital plane of the moon is this region here, and you see you can see it cutting in beneath the ecliptic plane and rising above the ecliptic plane. You can see it in the circle there with the shadow. So this is a very clear picture of what's going on. And only when the orbital plane of the moon cuts through the ecliptic, the ecliptic plane, and where that line, where it cuts, which is called the line of nodes, is lined up with the sun, earth and the sun, only then can the moon be directly in alignment between the earth and the sun, or on the other side, the moon could be, once again, lined up with the earth and the sun. So that's the condition needed for an eclipse to take place. And of course, the uh, moon being here is going to produce a solar eclipse. The moon o over here, the Earth's shadow is going to enable a lunar eclipse. Just a little more detail once again, looking at the whole picture. Let's start over here. So here we have the line of nodes where the moon's orbital path, that uh, plane, is cutting through the ecliptic plane. Well, this line is not lined up with the sun, of course, and so there's a problem. So when the moon is, as best as it can be, lined up with the sun and the earth, it's not lined up very well, as you can see when you look under here, a more two-scale picture. Because of that five deg degree tilt, look at the, the new moon and the shadow it casts, how it's way over the earth, and the moon's shadow is cast way over the moon. So you don't get a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. So that's very typical. That happens most of the time. As we progress along here, now the line of nodes is passing through the moon, the earth, the moon again, and the sun. That's the condition for the sun hitting the moon, the moon casting a shadow on the earth, the earth casting a shadow on the moon. Over here, things aren't lined up again. And back over here, they are lined up. So the line of nodes is passing through the earth and the sun, and we can have eclipses again. So there it is. Hopefully that makes some sense. And now let's investigate the geometry and detail of the eclipses a little bit more. So, a lunar eclipse, we have the Earth blocking the Sun, and here we can see the shadow region. This dark shadow region is called the umbra, and the wider shadow region here is called the penumbra. Based on this region in the penumbra, you can still see part of the Sun. In the umbra, you can see none of the Sun. So the basic idea is the Moon as it orbits around the Earth, is passing into the shadow of Earth, and when it passes into the shadow, it's eclipsed. So it's as simple as that. Keep in mind that the correct scale, here's Earth, here's Moon, and if you look at that shadow, the, the Sun is so far away that the shadow converges very slowly. So it literally covers way more than the entire dimension of the Moon. So there's a really huge shadow from Earth. So the phase of the Moon must be full. And that's just because it's got to be lined up with the Earth and the Sun, so it's a full moon. It's on the other side of the Earth. 
from the sun. Near perfect alignment must exist, as we just talked about. The moon passes into the shadow of Earth, either partial or full. So partial is more common if the moon is in this region here. Here it's partial, here it's partial. Um, actually, partial here, but full when it's fully inside the umbra. This happens two, three, or four times a year. And so it's not that abnormal, but it is not 12 times a year as you might otherwise think. All right, this graphic may clarify it just that much more. So what we have is the five degree tilt between the ecliptic and the moon's orbit. So the ecliptic plane and the moon's orbital plane. There's a node at the, at the intersection of those two points and a lunar eclipse can only occur if the moon passes close to or on a node. Or we have a full moon at that point. The Earth's shadow is superimposed on that point. That's perfect alignment. We don't need perfect alignment because the Earth's shadow, the umbral shadow, which is totality, is large enough that even when they're not directly coinciding with a, a nodal line, you still have at least a partial eclipse of the moon. This shows the extent of the umbral region of the Earth's shadow. It shows that it spans multiple moon diameters, so that makes the size of the shadow pretty clear. It's usually not that distinct, but nevertheless, that's what it is. And to look at the possible types of eclipses, we're talking lunar eclipse. Let's investigate that just a little bit. We have a total eclipse, which requires just about near perfect alignment. So here we have the moon right in the umbral region, and it's totally blocked from the sun. It's a little bit reddish. We'll discuss that in a little bit. Then we have a partial eclipse. Partial eclipse is just where well, the moon is going partly through the umbra region and partly through the penumbra. And it looks like you're kind of taking a bite out of the moon. And then the penumbral eclipse. Penumbral eclipse is the most common because the penumbral region is very large. And it just means the moon is not that well lined up and it's passing through a region where only part of the sun is blocked. And all that really happens is there's a slight dimming to the moon and for the most part, you have no idea, just casually gazing up into the sky, that anything's happening at all. The geometry of a lunar eclipse is clearly shown here. So as we've already referred to, we have the penumbra, the umbra, and here's the basic geometry of rays coming from the sun to produce that. Only total blockage of the sun in this region here. But there's still the question of what produces that reddish moon and I want to just show you the physics of that real briefly. So we have light from the sun, and it's white light and contains all the various wavelengths, all the colors. Well, the Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere, and the atmosphere acts like a lens. It actually refracts or bends light coming into it. All right, so this dotted line shows the umbral region. So this is the umbral region where there should be total blockage of the sun, but somehow, we see a reddish moon, and here's how. So light from the sun hitting the atmosphere actually has the property where it removes or scatters blue light, which is the short wavelength light. What's left is the red light that's in the spectrum of the sun, and so that red light is bent by the atmosphere, and it's literally bent into the umbral region, hits the moon, the moon reflects it off to an observer here, and in the middle of the night, observing this wonderful, beautiful, blood-red moon that's really red sunlight reflecting off the moon. And it's the, same read, it's the same phenomena that causes us to see a red sunset. The blue light is removed by the sunlight going through the atmosphere. And as we observe the sunset, we see the sun as it would look like with the blue wavelengths significantly removed. So there you go. This is kind of interesting. This is the view you would have on the moon if you were looking at the Earth during 
a total eclipse, total eclipse of the moon. And from what we just said, that red light coming across the atmosphere and bent down into the moon would be seen as a ring of fire around the Earth. So that ring of red light coming from the atmosphere of the Earth, ultimately from the sun, being bent by the atmosphere, and this is what you would see. So that'd be quite a sight. I would love to be able to go to the moon and, and see this. That would be awesome. So here's a little bit more clarity on the red light. Notice it tends to be concentrated in the, the center region of the umbral shadow. So you see more red here than on the, out, outs, the outskirts. Well, now we're ready to tackle the solar eclipse. And what you'll notice right away is the moon is a whole lot smaller than the Earth. Consequently, its shadow is a lot smaller and therefore it's questionable whether even whether the shadow can even get to the Earth. Now it turns out that the moon can just cover the Sun. The moon is 400 times smaller than the Sun, but the Sun is 400 times further away from the Earth. So both of them subtend about a half a degree in the sky and the orbits of both the Earth around the Sun and the Moon around the Earth are not circular, so there's variations of sizes in both the Moon and the Sun, which I'll discuss briefly in a minute. But let it suffice now to say that the Moon is sufficient to cover the Sun. And when it does, we have a small spot here at least where you have total darkness on the surface of the Earth. Here is a satellite image of that exact phenomena. Totality is occurring in this region right here, and that's a pretty awesome phenomena. A little bit more on that. It's traveling. I mean, the Earth is rotating, the Moon is orbiting, so how does this all work? If you're interested. Well, the Earth's rotation at the equator is about a thousand miles an hour. So it's rotating eastward at about a thousand miles an hour because of the counterclockwise rotation looking from above. So that's an eastward motion, which would result in a westward motion of this umbral shadow, if it wasn't for the fact that the moon wasn't also moving eastward. But it is, and in fact, the umbral shadow from the moon's orbit is moving eastward at about 2,000 miles an hour. So the moon is making the dot go 2,000 miles an hour this way, the Earth's orbit is making the dot go the umbral shadow go a thousand miles per hour this way. So who wins? Well, it's the moon's orbit that wins, and the net effect is that the umbral shadow moves at over a thousand miles an hour eastward. So that's the combined effect. Now the shadow itself is only about a hundred miles in diameter, so it only takes a few minutes for the shadow to pass across a given region on the Earth. So that shadow is moving very quickly, and the maximum amount of time you can be in the shadows about seven minutes, but usually it's just a couple of minutes. Well, just like we considered for the lunar eclipse, let's consider the alignment needed for the solar eclipse, and it's a little more critical. Again, the moon's orbit is inclined by about five degrees to the ecliptic, and we're showing a node here again, and this is where the moon needs to be at the crossing of these planes. And, of course, that's going to be a new moon because it's trying to block the sun. But because the sun and the moon are essentially the same size, it's really important for them to be almost directly, exactly on that node where you don't get a full eclipse. So it's a lot more finicky. The alignment here is a lot more critical if you want a true total solar eclipse. As you can see here, even just a little ways away, you're only going to get what would be called a partial eclipse. Well, there are three possibilities, just like for the lunar eclipses. So we have a total eclipse, again, requiring almost perfect alignment. It's a really awesome thing when the moon covers the entire sun. We see the corona. This is enhanced brightness here. But the umbral shadow reaches the Earth and you're standing there in that directly in that umbral shadow. That's a total eclipse. Partial eclipse, that's associated with the penumbral shadow. So if instead of standing in the 
umbral shadow, you're just off a little bit, you're going to see a bite of the moon out of the sun. <laughs> the moon takes a bite out of the sun, and that's a partial eclipse. And then an annular eclipse is the special geometry where, well, the moon is just too far away from the Earth because of the eccentric orbit. So it's out here a ways, and the shadow just doesn't quite make it. You see it stops about right there. In that case, it doesn't quite cover the sun. And so you see a ring of fire around the sun. That's an annular eclipse. doesn't quite make totality. Now I'm sure you're going to want to know this little detail about solar eclipses. Why are they sometimes annular, where the moon can't quite cover the sun? Well, it's pretty obvious here when you look at the size variations in the moon and the sun in the respective orbits of the moon about the Earth and the Earth about the sun. So this image shows what's going on here. So we have the sun and the Earth going around the sun. And it's got two points. On January 2nd, we have the closest approach of the Earth to the sun. It's known as perihelion perilously close to the Sun. And then on the other end we have the furthest distance from the Sun, aphelion, apt to fly away, around in July. So of course at aphelion the Sun is smallest, at perihelion the Sun is largest, and these are the actual relative sizes. In a similar way, in an analogous way, the Moon going around the Earth we have perigee, perilously close to the Earth an apogee, apt to fly away. Just a little mental memory instrument there. But therefore at apogee we, we have the smallest moon because it's the furthest away and at perigee the largest moon. So we have those different possibilities. With the moon at apogee, that'd be where it's the smallest. It can't cover the sun at any time. So this moon cannot cover, the smallest moon cannot cover the smallest sun. However, with the moon at perigee, the largest moon can cover the small sun and the largest sun. So it covers any sun. So the best combo for eclipses would be the moon at perigee, so it's the largest, and the sun at aphelion, where it's the smallest. Did I say? smallest or largest, where the moon is the largest, sun is the smallest, and that's where we get the best solar eclipses. So that's how the size determines if the solar eclipse is total or annular. Here's an example of a total solar eclipse in some detail. You can see the features of the atmosphere of the sun, in particular the chromosphere, where you have this illuminated, colorful, hot gas that can be seen quite readily. Here's the diamond ring effect. Ha! Huh, look at that. Diamond ring. Get it? What's that from? Well, there's a little crater over here on the moon where the sun is just peeking through, producing a brilliant spot, making it look like a diamond ring. Here's an almost total but annular eclipse some time ago, so it just doesn't quite make it in covering the sun. This shows the progression during the day during a solar eclipse. So of course the Earth is spinning and the, the Sun is progressing along here. And as it does so, well the Earth, the, the Moon is also. But the Moon is moving eastward and so it's taking a little bit of a bigger bite out of the Sun in each one of these frames until it gets to, to totality and then passes across the Sun. It's passing across the Sun toward the east and there's a fairly wide region of the sky that's covered by the moon and the sun during the process of the total solar eclipse. This shows lines of totality through 2035 and notice that totality does not occur for that big of a sweep across the earth and it's a very you know short or narrow I should say path. Well there are a couple of notable ones here 2017, August 21, 2024, April 8th. Look where they cross. Oh my goodness. It's in the United States, not too far from us. In fact, this one in 2017, August 21st, it's in Kentucky. That's awesome. 
Well, here is a list of some of the upcoming eclipses and total and annular. And there's about one total solar eclipse per year somewhere on Earth. Actually, a lot of times that's two th or even three, but they are just in a small region and typically in the ocean, not where any people are, as opposed to a lunar eclipse, which because the shadow is so big, everybody on Earth sees it instead of just a few people on Earth that see the solar eclipse, so they seem a lot more rare. Well, just as I mentioned before, this event here, I'm going to be there. So maybe in 2017, August 21, you will join me in a little town in Kentucky where the middle of the of totality will be. It'll be about four minutes of totality. And that's going to be my first experience of a total solar eclipse. I hope it's a clear day. Maybe I'll see you face to face there for the first time. All right, so it's disclaimer time. Never look at the sun with the unprotected eye. Um, not a good idea. You can permanently damage your eyes. So even if there's a almost total eclipse, you can take a piece of cardboard, put a pinhole in it, and project the image onto another board or something else. Another option is to do what I would do, and something I have is a welder's glass that's dark enough that you can look directly at the sun. So that might be worth investing in before August 21, 2017, when you're going to be in Kentucky observing the wonderful solar eclipse in that particular era of time. See you then. Actually, probably see you before in the next presentation.